Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for the inviting me in for that opportunity to talk among so many people who've actually influenced this work. So I'm trying to get this in my back pocket. Um, so I, hopefully I'm going to tell you something today that hopefully it's interesting. I think it's more interesting than just the aspect I'm going to start talking about, which is financial markets. Um, I think it touches on a lot of the aspects from yesterday, ecology, collective behavior, but it's also since we're in the physical day today, is that something very physics-y and physical about it that I'll get to in a moment. Um, just to give you a quick kind of upshot of where I'm heading with this, um, I'm going to talk to you about something you may or may not have heard about, um, sub-second trading in financial markets. Um, I'm going to try and convince you that there's something interesting going on. It's not just a faster world down there, it's a new world. And the point is it's a world that's beyond um, human response times. And I'm going to try and convince you that there's a, a, an interesting kind of phase transition to a new type of behavior. Um, in um, a new type of world, really, which is really just dominated by algorithms. Um, I'm going to then talk about um, implication, possible implications for system fragility, um, something um, you know, one might think if there's a lot going on in the sub-second world, I don't have to worry about it because I can't access it and nobody else can. But that's, that's not quite the case, as I'll, as I'll, as I'll try and show you. And I'll end up talking about something which is um, really quite speculative, but the results are not speculative, but the interpretation is. And so if anyone has any better ideas about than my interpretation of what I'm going to show you at the end, then please, please let me know. Um, my funding sources are um, MITRE, ONR, and IARPA, although I'm not talking about IARPA work here. Um, so, um, so this is not my work. This is um, very, um, some very interesting, as, as Doyen said, there are some very interesting works out looking at the networks of financial stability. Um, there's a number of papers out. This is one, one particular um, work. Um, it's quite interesting to see, um, you know, according to what measure you take as to which banks are connected to which. Um, but, of course, what's missing from this type of view um, is um, the role of time. And we all know that. We all know that you know, net networks involve time. Um, but um, I'm going to talk about the role of time in finance, um, which is quite an, quite an important one because it touches on um, actually a physical um, speed limit. So we all know that nothing can go tra that travel faster than the speed of light. Um, on here, I've got the times for return trips for light. So this is light that can go through an optic fiber, um, you know, even through an optic fiber, that slows it down. Um, if you're just sending light through a vacuum and then it immediately bouncing back, this is the fastest that it can travel. And um, just to put up here um, a, kind of, uh, a, a, a kind of reality check on, although these are short times, this is actually quite a long time. For example, London to Chicago. Um, because the, you know, all of our laptops, um, if they're cycling at three gigahertz, then in principle, if you could rig up that clock to just do a buy and sell um, on the cycle of the clock, you'd be, doing, um, you'd be able to do a million trades in the time that it took just for a, a trader in London to, to trade on the uh, Chicago exchange. So you'd be, if you, you were sitting in Starbucks at the side of the, uh, you know, in Chicago, and you had your laptop, you, you would be able to do a million trades. And of course, you know, if you can get in quick, um, you've got a, an, an immediate advantage. So this has um, set off this whole world, which I knew, really knew nothing about, of, of, of race, the race to zero, as they call it, race to zero latency. And um, some crazy things are happening. For example, the first transatlantic cable that's been built in 10 years, it's being laid now, um, not because you know, nice messages are going to be passed between one continent and another, it's purely for traders. And it's purely to shave five milliseconds off the round trip. And so they've got you know, cameras following along the seabed looking for the shortest path around the rocks and just to shave five seconds off the, off the round trip. There are, there are chips, you know, I used to work in the, in the they're looking at um, semiconductor quant uh, um, processes, um, but it's quite interesting that um, you know, there are people building into chips 
um, trades. So you build a trading scheme, a trading strategy into the chip just to be faster. And so um, there's one, the, the kind of speed record, this was about six months ago, apparently somebody was telling me, yes, it's, it's even quicker now. There, there are chips around that can process, so they'll take in an input of what the market's doing and spit out a buy or a sell, and also a risk check, apparently, um, within 740 nanoseconds, it's ten, nanosecond is 10 to the minus nine seconds. Um, but of course, as we know, the human reaction time is, well, you know, mine, mine is certainly a lot longer than a second. Um, but you know, most of us is, is, is a lot longer than a second, and particularly if we've actually got to think rather than just um, have some kind of action. So um, this is a strange world. And so the extent to which countries are connected, banks are connected, stocks are connected, um, they're going to be, they, they, and they are, 70% of trading is now computer trading on the US market. Um, they're going to be increasingly connected on shorter and shorter timescales. And so time is going to take on a, not just something you can just add on afterwards, it, it, it sort of is the driving factor. So um, I want to just, um, so before um, uh, moving on, I just want to give, I'm, I'm obviously not the first person to thought about fast trading. There's a lot of people thinking about um, um, so-called high-frequency trading. Um, I absolutely recommend that you read Doyen Farmer's paper if you're interested in ecological perspective on computer trading. Um, there are a number of people um, looking at high-frequency trading. However, a lot of it, in fact, I don't know anything that doesn't um, in, in this list, uh, um, um, they tend to talk about high-frequency trading as trading that's fast. You know, a minute is fast, 30 seconds is fast. And a lot of the, the crashes that have happened recently, the, the flash crash of 2010, it was fast, but it was actually quite slow. It was, it was you know, five minutes, 10 minutes. So although that's fast, it's, it's very, very slow compared to you know, 10 nanos, um, 10 microseconds or milliseconds, which is the scale in which the trading is actually being done. So I'm going to be talking about things that are much faster the, than this. So let's just check out, I, I made a claim about the, the um, reaction time, so I, I need your help with this. I've never tried this out, so I'm not quite sure it worked. But I want you to imagine, I don't know if you ever have imagined yourself in a, in a trading, you know, an alternative career in a trading um, environment, but imagine that you did do that one day and you were sitting in Goldman Sachs or you go along for their interview and they're going to check out your reaction. You're going to, they're going to give you a trading strategy, so I want you all to think you've got a trading strategy. And your trading strategy is that they've given you is that you are going to buy when the market goes down. So when you see the market go down, you've got to buy. So you've got a little bit of asset, a little bit of money ready, and you can do this once. It's a one shot. And I mean, you haven't got any button in front of you, but you know, maybe you could just kind of clap when you're going to have your one shot. And I'd like to see how this plays out. You're going to see this in real time. So this is how you're sitting looking at a screen. This happens to be American steel, US steel. Um, sorry, you can't see that very well, but it's, you're going to see stock price in real time. The little colored dots here, this happens to be 1050 on one day in 2010. Little colored dots are the prices you're seeing quoted on different exchanges. So you can buy on any exchange, let's just say that. So you've got to clap your hand when you, want to, when you see the market go down far enough that you're going to buy and you're going to, you know, you're, 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 then you're going to make your profit. So let's see if I can get this going. Um, I've got an old Mac, so yeah, okay. So this is real time. So as I said, these dots here, I mean, the fact that they're not continuous is, of course, you only get prices when something is actually traded. So you meant to clap, by the way. Oh, somebody already did. Okay, you, you lost the job. Um, right? Um, so when, when the price goes down, you know, we're going to see who makes the highest, you know, the, the most profit. So carry, carry on. Yeah, you might want to wait a little bit. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. Now, this is what I'm going to talk about today, this thing. Now, this is, this is quite strange. This is something which lasted 100 milliseconds, which is why you didn't see it, or you saw it afterwards, but you couldn't do anything about it. But it's, you know, it's not a one-off. We have um, gone back in the last few years and found thousands of these. And these are the things that I actually want to talk about because I, these, 
is what I'm going to try and convince you. These are the output of this new machine ecology, this new world that's sort of grown up beyond our reach. OK, so here's the, here's the deal with the data. So um, we, we trawled back through stock data, all exchanges, um, across all exchanges, um, US exchanges, um, in the past five years, around six years, actually. Around 2006, you don't really see any. Around 2007, they begin to pick up. Um, we've counted, we're only going to count ones, you know, you can change these parameters if you want, but you've got to choose, you know, the, the, these are reasonable. If something go, if it goes down 10 times, so by the way, um, you know, this is the thing you just saw. This isn't just some, you know, guy who put his finger down on the wrong button, because then you just see one huge trade. And the dots here are the size, proportional to the size of the trade. So you're actually seeing the trades escalating down. These are actually traded prices. So there's a real price. People are actually trade, or machines are actually trading here. And then this thing is coming back up again. So um, 10 consecutive downs. It's like 10 throws of a, um, you know, heads or a tails. Of course, that's unlikely, but not completely unlikely. But we also make the change larger than 0.8%. That's quite large. I mean, that's actually huge on these, um, ti on these you know, second time scales. Um, we found about 18,000. Um, there are very, very few of them with a duration of around a second. But there's a huge number with a duration much less than a second. And um, I'll now show you there are spikes and there are also dips. I'm also going to show you that they're not just simply some, you know, it's not just a simply a faster version of what's going on uh, on the daily scale or the hourly scale. This happens to be Bank of America, close to my heart, because I've got my account there. Um, so this is Bank of America. This was coming into 2008, into the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. Um, you can see down here the price, you know, the price is kind of bobbling around, and I guess people were beginning to pick up that things were going badly. Here, down here, you've got the volume and the volatility. But up here in purple, you've got the, the, every time there's one of these fractures that we all missed, um, that I've put a little thing up here. I call them fracture. I, I know, you know, I, just because in, it's, it seems to me like it's a kind of rip, not in space, but also in time. It's kind of a temporal fracture in the market, in the financial market system. So um, you could see these things, and they're not really correlated. I mean, to some degree they are, and to some degree they're not. Certainly over here they're not. You know, there's a huge uh, fluctuations in volume over here. I don't get lots of fractures. But I do seem to get this kind of build-up. I'll talk later about the build-up. First of all, I'm just going to talk about the fractures themselves. I'm going to keep calling them the fractures. These 18,520. Want to try and understand why are there so many of them, and what are their kind of characteristics? In the lead-up then to the stability, um, to the um, you know the, um, the 2008 September Lehman Brothers collapse. Um, here are the top, we looked at the top 20 stock. Which are the stock that have the most of these fractures? You know, if you're thinking of something almost like breaking apart, like a kind of aircraft wing, you know, which of these aircraft would you not want to get on? Um, and um, out of all the stock that, you know, are traded, actually the top 10 are all financial. They're all financial. Morgan Stanley's down here has the most fractures. Then um, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, etc., etc., etc. Lehman Brothers is in here. And what I've shown here on this bar is, I mean, the black up here is read to the right. That's the Standard and Poor's. The cumulative number of red is the spikes and blue is the dips. Um, they kind of track each other. But what happens is they have these kind of onset. Um, you know, it looks quite a way before the actual macro breakage. I'm not going to talk more about this. We're now looking into the kind of breakdown as though it were a kind of cascading um, failure. I'm not going to talk about that. I just want to show that to you because it's really kind of suggestive of some kind of breakdown. But at the micro scale, at the millisecond scale, so we always tend to think of you know, that there's nothing down there that can actually affect what's up here in the daily scale, but I, I'm not convinced. Um, 
okay, I'm going to put that on hold, the whole escalation thing. I'm just going to look at the character of these 18,520 fractures. When you do that, when you look at the distribution of them, so I'm going to plot out just as you, were for, as you would for avalanche sizes. You know, we've heard a lot about the you know, sandpile models. So it's just as you do on that, so the frequency distribution, histogram, number of times I get an avalanche of a certain size, so the number of times I get a fracture of a certain size. And I'm going to look at that distribution. And um, um, thanks to Mark Newman's work um, with um, Aaron Clausett and, and, and Cosmo Shalisi, they have a rigorous way of doing the power law testing, which we had to actually augment here, because we, you know, you, it's, you've got to do the Monte Carlo testing to get the p-value. You don't want to just do that with a few. So we you know, parallelize this, um, the, the, the whole Monte Carlo procedure. But what I'm showing here, then, as the result of that, is the best fit um, um, power law exponent. And this isn't just kind of drawing a straight line. This is um, following their procedure, um, which I thoroughly recommend to anyone who talks about um, power laws. Um, so here's the power law exponent, and here's the goodness of fit. So this is the p-value. And I want you really to focus on the, um, the blue line. Um, and here I've got the time scale up here. This is a second. These are the dura So what I'm going to plot here, I'm going to take, for example, if I take here uh, 1,000 milliseconds, that's one second, I'm going to draw out all the fractures that have a duration longer than 1,000 milliseconds, and I'm going to do their distribution look at their distribution, and I'm going to get the alpha, and that's the left hand, and the p-value, and that's the right, right side. And then I'll repeat it for 900 milliseconds, and then 800 milliseconds, and I'll go down and down and down. There's a fundamental change in this system as you move between, say, a thousand, so in other words, a second, just above a second, the scale at which we're all operating, down to about 600 milliseconds. There's an interesting asymmetry between crash between those fractures that go down and up and the fractures that go up and down. Why is that? Um, I don't know. But you might think that if, the human, if humans are going to kind of struggle against machines, if they're going to step in there with their big red button and do something, that they're going to be more likely to do it when they see that the system crashed than when it starts rising. And so you might be seeing here this kind of struggle between you know, humans and machines on this scale and machines down here, and humans are gradually dropping out. I don't know, but that's what it, it's, it's possible. It's quite interesting to see that actually the fastest time scale that's been recorded of somebody not just kind of putting your foot on the brake, um, but actually thinking about something and making a decision and then doing something um, so a grand, um, a grand master in chess to realize a strategic move, it's 650 milliseconds. Um, is that a coincidence that it happened to hit there at the point one value for goodness of fit? I, I, I don't know. So there's this fundamental phase transition. Why do we, so therefore, there's, now there's two questions. Why are there so many of these spikes? What, why, what is it about machines kind of fighting each other? Um, that gives spikes, and, um, and, 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 and why is this, 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 this oh, there's now this kind of this fundamental change in the distribution of these, of these spikes? It's like another world, another planet, where avalanches look different. Um, here's a model of it. I'm not saying it's the model. It's just a model. And um, it's a model that quite a few people here in this room have, um, have worked on. Um, it's a binary model of a market. Now, binary models of a market have been around for many, uh, you know, back to when um, Doim was um, doing it originally, and then we all kind of jumped in, looked at Alpha old game and all these kind of things. And everybody always said, you know, binary model, that's not how humans behave. You know, you don't have yes, no, I'll look at some simple binary string strategy. But, but machines, that's probably quite a good rule for how machines work. So here's a model of what might be going on. I'm going to take um, a bunch of, of machines that are not connected together. I'll just explain what the connection is in a minute. They're all trying to look at the past record of outcomes. And they're trying to look for a pattern. And they have a couple of internal rules, internal lookup tables. And they'll use the best performing one. And they'll choose that, that pattern. They'll choose the output of that strategy. And they'll use that. 
and then they'll go on to the next, they'll update that strategy and they'll move on. It will so happen that if the, the number of available strategies, or the size of the strategy space, in other words, is small, then by chance, a lot of them will be, begin to crowd in. They'll collectively use the same strategy, even if it, it's unwilling, but they'll, 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 they'll just do that. If the number of strategies is small compared with the number of machines. Well, we know the number of machines down there in the, you know, the sub-second scale is large. What about the number of strategies? Well, the number of strategies for a machine is actually, I mean, humans are already out of this now, talking about just if it was just machines. If you've, got, if you've just got machines, then um, if they're getting data on a timestamp of, say, you know, 100 milliseconds, if you're operating on 200 millisecond timescale, so if you're a trading machine on 200 milliseconds, you've only got the last, you know, you've, you've got the last 200 milliseconds to decide what, what to do next if you're doing something every 200 milliseconds but you're getting data time stamped every 100 milliseconds. So you've only got two bits of data. So you might have a zero, zero if the market goes down, down, or a one, one if the market went up, up. Um, there aren't that many things that you can do. You can say, well, you know, I've got zero, zero, or zero, one, or one, zero, or one, one. There's only four possible patterns that you'd see. And so there's only two things you can do, buy or sell. So the actual strategies, if we classify it in terms of things that you can do given a particular history, is actually quite small. And so what we would postulate is that when you get down into this small regime here, you've actually got this crowding, this unintentional crowding in strategy space of the machines. And when you do that, and this is a result from quite a few years ago that we had, um, when you do that, um, you, you generate a price series that has these huge spikes in it and huge dips. They can also recover here. Um, but huge spikes and huge dips, precisely because the machines suddenly begin to see the same, they, they, see, or they always see the same pattern, but then they begin to choose the same strategy. They've got two rules, and they begin to choose the same one. They all crowd into it, bingo, they all do the same thing. You've got this huge spike. As you go up in the time scale, of course, you've got more time. The machines have more time to think about things, so they've now got you know, 300 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, 500. They've got more patterns that they can see, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, or 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. It's a richer space. It's a bigger space. So the chance of them crowding is less, less big. And when you get up to 100, some millis uh, you know, 100 seconds, you've also got humans kind of jumping in, etc. Um, what happens in this model that I just told you about is that you don't just gradually change the regime over. There's a, there's a phase transition. There's a phase transition. There's an abrupt change, exactly what we saw in the data. There's an abrupt change. It's not just this gradual change over to machine world. There's an abrupt change. And it happens right around 600 or 700 or 800 milliseconds, right where humans cut out. Um, you can go ahead and get some interesting, um, you know, kind of analytic results. Uh, Esteban Moro in, in this room has done a lot of it. He's got a great review on this type of modeling. Um, interestingly, Dave Cliff in Bristol just, has just been doing human-machine interaction experiments, and he found something reasonably consistent with this. So in a controlled laboratory experiment. Here I've just shown volatility versus this curve, effectively this line of time and volatility shoots up in this kind of phase transition here. So, um, just to, you know, it's not just price, it's volume. What about the volume? You talked to us about the transaction. Yeah, okay, right, so here's the volume down here. Volume is very different. The volume of the number of trades in this model, at least, um, undergoes this abrupt transition as well. And if you look at the real data, I didn't show you the volume, but this is silver. I just happened to choose a commodity here. I didn't choose the stock price, but silver. Um, here, you know, these huge spikes. Um, I mean, is it the same? I, 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 I don't know. It looks similar. So what we're spending a lot of time now, and I'm not going to go through this, but um, we're going back to all of that kind of work on these binary games and trying to unravel what it is that makes the situation susceptible to these micro-crashes. Why are these micro-crashes important? Well, because there's no regulation. The regulation exists for Gaussian markets or near-Gaussian markets. All options are written for that, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing going on at the sub-second scale in terms of regulation. So you know, that's where we get our funding from through the um, MITRE, which gets it from the government, um, is that should there be regulation there? 
What I'm showing you here, just to show you, is um, this is the kind of, you can look at the gain move around these states in this De Bruyne graph. When down here, these are the weightings for each of these nodes. When a node hits, when a node begins to get red, it gets hot. It becomes susceptible to trigger a crash. Um, all this to say that there's machinery out there. You know, the effect is new, but the kind of theoretical machinery has been around for about 10 years. So it's kind of interesting. It's a kind of interesting outlet for all those things that we, we were all doing a while ago. Um, I'm going to go back to this escalation. I've got a couple of minutes left. I'll go back to this escalation. We were kind of intrigued by this. So what is it about this build-up? What happens if I look at the time between the events? So again, a lot of people in this room have looked at bursty time series, looking at kind of bursty, you know, the burstiness of, of um, you know, Laszlo and uh, many others, and um, Luis looked at this. Um, I'm going to look at this now, not overall. I'm going to look at the actual escalation here. Not much of an escalation, of course, it's stochastic, but you, know, you can gradually see there are more and more of these events as you build up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, something which has been around in the marketing literature and psychology literature and actually animal behavior literature for 100 years, animal behavior literature. It's the idea of looking at this in terms of, sort of progress curve. That somehow, you know, there's an event and then something happens, you know, maybe it's due to the system's learnt, maybe it hasn't learnt, maybe it adapts something. And then there's another event. And those events are getting quicker and quicker. And, you see, and this is a known effect from, as I said, acquisition of skills. Um, it, you know, this is back to the date 1936. Data was taken on how long it takes someone to sort items and how, you know, they, the successive sorting of, of items, they get better. It happens quicker. Um, proofreading, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also a set of um, interesting data from um, Power Law of Practice um, Journal of Marketing. People looking at tra uh, uh, internet sites, um, music sites, how long it takes them to navigate. You know, they get faster and faster every time they visit. We were interested in this because if you look at this existing literature, there's um, and you, um, you know, the pe people there have looked at how events get faster and faster, and they plot them out uh, according to a power curve, which is exactly the same power curve that Doyne was talking about with rights law, but now the cost is in time. Um, they plot this out, and there are two in important variables, which is the intercept and the slope. Now, I know, you know, I teach physics 101, so I know if I give somebody a physics problem, I mean, there are certain students, you give them a physics problem, and it takes them, you know, five minutes. And then you give them the same problem, and it takes them six minutes. And then it will take them three minutes, and then it will take them five minutes again. Their tau would be around five minutes, and their B would be practically zero. And then there are other students, you can give it to them, you know, it takes them ten minutes the first go. And by the time they're on the second one, they're down to four minutes. And then they're down to two minutes. And then they've got your job, and then you're out. Um, but the, um, but the, the, the whole point is that there, there's no set relation when humans are giving, from what I know, when humans are doing a task, they're against the system, but the system is passive. They've got something they're struggling against, but that system is passive. The problem is passive. All of these problems are passive. Then there's no relationship between the way in which they learn, which is the B, and their initial time. But that's not what we see when we see these struggle problems. I'm going to jump to something completely different. I probably want to put some um, you know, indigenous um, Indian groups up there. Um, because I, we've spent a lot of time in my group looking at struggles, two-sided struggles. And now I'm going to bring it back to what this has to do with the, with the stock market. Here, um, here's my attempt at doing social, mathematical social science. Because the equation is just, you know, you add tribes to an insurgency, to a mafia, an army, and, the, and then you take away the state. And what, what does that give you? I've got no idea. But if you look at the date, look at the events of violent events. These are guerrilla killings of in, um, not just indigenous, but also, you know, the mestizo and the, you know, just the general population. In, and, you know, since 88 to 2005, they gradually get closer together. Of course, there are all these disruptions, just as there might be, you know, different technology, you know. Insurgent uh, guerrillas use different, um, have different um, technology. They bring in different technology. The, the state does something, etc. But you gradually see this same kind of curve. In other words, the time between events initially was, was large. It becomes smaller and smaller. 
Um, just over here, just because in, anyone's worrying about me fitting a straight line through that, the residuals are pretty Gaussian and pretty close to uncorrelated. Um, but we've been doing this in, four, in, in many different systems. And what's intriguing is you get exactly the same kind of behavior. And this is where I've headed to my last point of this kind of generic relationship. I think it's a generic relationship. I'm not quite sure. Um, what I'm plotting here is the B, which is the way in which you learn, you know, the rate in which you learn. It's not a rate because it's a power law, as, as Doyen was saying, for the, you know, the, I do something in, in, in an hour, then I take, it takes me 30 minutes, then I do it in three minutes, etc. And I'm plotting that against the first, that first time interval. So, for example, I just showed you an area in Magdalena in Colombia where the gorilla and the, the FARC and the ELN, that's that point there. And there was a certain B, which was the slope, and there was a certain tau 1, which was the initial value I've, um, between attacks. And then I've got all these other values for all those other departments, municipalities in Colombia. And they follow this line. Now, they shouldn't do that because, as I showed you before, you know, if it's humans against some kind of task that doesn't change, there ain't no line. It's not there. There's no line. And the same here. There's no definite dependence between tau 1 and B. But when there's a struggle, when there's some kind of struggle, and you know, the state hasn't changed here really, when there's a struggle, the gorilla is struggling against the state to inflict injury, they, there's, it induces this kind of correlation. But we don't just see it for the insurgency, this brings me back then to the market. If I take the time, if I do the same exercise for all of those different stocks, the top 10 financial stock, and I look at the relationship between the time before, between the first two fractures and the rate at which the fractures appear, again, they seem to follow this same line. And I think that's because the machine or the algorithm is fighting against the system. And of course, the market will always react back, as Doim was saying. You know, there's a market impact. It reacts back on what you do, unlike the one-person tasks. We've extended it in other areas. We've looked at protests. Same thing. These were protests in cities in Poland, leading up to the, um, pretty much up to the, um, break up of the, of the, of the USSR. And um, we have a group, uh, we collaborate with a psychology group in Miami that look at mother, infant, you wouldn't think mother and infant, I'm sure father and infant will be even worse, but mother and infant um, re, um, um, interaction. Apparently the, 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 you know, the infant just wants smiles from the mother and the mother just wants smiles from the infant, but of course they're not actually compatible. Um, and so the infant cries. And so they have this, there's this huge area in psychology looking at baby reactions. And the reason is you want to try and detect which babies might have autism and might be, ab, you know, there might be abnormal reaction. It would be great if you could recognize that from this type of test. But again, you know, these are individual of these dots are like individual municipalities or individual um, stock or individual cities with protests. Um, they each have their own B and their own tau value but they seem to follow a similar line, which suggests there's something kind of innate or generic underlying them. I'm going to leave you with the, the last slide, which is my kind of attempt at a theory of that, but it, it's not really very good. Um, it gets you the fact that B should be around, you know, has values in the range of 0 to about 1.5. And I like it because it's a kind of physics thing, but, um, but it doesn't really get you the explanation of why these follow this nice straight line. It's the idea of, we all know the Red Queen theory. You know, you run on the, Red Queen runs on the spot because everybody else is running. But now I want you to think of the distance that the Red Queen is from everybody else. So everybody else is the other system, like the rest of the market, or the mother, or the government in Colombia, or you know, the state police in, 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 um, in Poland. Um, so the Red Queen, who's the, 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 you know, the algorithm or the gorilla insurgency, um, is running, and maybe occasionally they get ahead. Now, the Red Queen theory has nothing in it about getting ahead. So if you imagine the Red Queen's lead is some kind of stochastic walk, then you'd think that her advantage, the relative advantage, would go up as the number of steps, the number of uh, successes, to some power which is not one. It's to some, you know, it would be 0.5 if it were a random walk. Um, 
since the advantage of the Red Queen is going to be something like one over the time between successful attacks, the more advantage I've got, the quicker I can make attacks, um, you might expect then that the, um, the result would be that the, um, the time between successful events for, for one side, the Red Queen, against the opponent, and therefore in, in dyad struggles in general, would go like this power law. But as for why they follow the particular line, that coupling, I haven't quite got yet. So I'll just leave you with that. Um, thank you very much, and um, open to any questions.